Hi, uh, this is Mark Bloomberg. I am a uh, counsel at Zubra Lawler and a member of the editorial board of Dead Cat Live Cat. And today we are privileged to have with us uh, Dr. Parain Naiha Naring, who is a uh, assistant professor at Harvard University and a founder and uh, chief technical officer at uh, Alero Quantum. And she's going to tell us about some of the exciting new developments in the field of uh, quantum computing today. So um, uh, welcome, Dr. Naren. And, and so thank you for, for uh, and, and, and thank you for being to speak to us today. Um, uh, just the first question, when did you first become interested in uh, quantum technology? I first became interested in this area as a graduate student. I was a graduate student now some time ago at Caltech. And at the time, folks who were thinking about quantum technologies were primarily you know, thinking about it more from an abstract and um, a slightly more fundamental science standpoint. This is before things like the devices that IBM made available became popular. This is before this uh, large influx of uh, startups in the space came about. And during the graduate work I did, you know, there were two things that are still very relevant in the area of confirmation science. One of them is, you know, how do we think about predicting um, various types of uh, matter molecules? And how do we actually contrast the power of formally and also practically the power of classical devices versus quantum devices? So, you know, a lot of uh, what I do uh, did back then and continue to, to work on is uh, thinking about using various types of computational architectures, making the most high fidelity predictions of, of materials and molecules. And, you know, that's one of the biggest use cases of quantum computing. So it's, it's come a, a long ways from, you know, initially where the conversations were very focused on, can we formally show that there will be an advantage to today, you know, various companies talking about a practical quantum advantage. The other thing that I worked on that remains relevant in quantum technologies is, you know, the theory of, of quantum photonics, quantum optics, uh, it's uh, a lot of my, my thesis was focused on that. And that is um, an area that's relevant for photonic quantum technologies. It's also relevant for applications where we're thinking of clustering various quantum devices. And I'm gonna tell you more about that uh, later in this conversation. Okay, great. Well, um, I know that you're, you're a, a, a professor, assistant professor at Harvard. What are some of the exciting quantum technology developments that are, that are taking place in academia today? One of the you know, biggest ones has been new types of uh, quantum computing platforms. So, you know, superconducting and trapped ion have, of course, entered the um, realm of uh, you know, commercial applications. But there are other types of um, qubit modalities that are being developed in academia uh, called atom based, things that are based on solid state qubits. That's uh, where we do a lot of our work. And some of these are a little bit further behind where superconducting and trapped ion systems are today, but could offer advantages that, that the uh, existing platforms don't. The other area that we work in that you know, is particularly relevant is uh, how do we build quantum repeaters? And, and these are small quantum devices that get incorporated into a network. These are what will make a scalable quantum network truly a reality. And so what my group works on, the Narang Lab at Harvard, is very, very focused on um, you know, designing third generation quantum repeaters. These are ones that would be intrinsically error corrected um, er quantum repeaters that can be part of a fault tolerant quantum network. So it's one that spans, say, the entire country. Yeah. What do you uh, believe be some of the first commercial applications that we're going to see with quantum computing technology? I think the biggest one, and uh, I've written about this in you know, Wired and other places, is very, very uh, likely going to be prediction of new uh, molecules and materials. And this is exciting because you know, we need to think about new catalysts. We need to think about greener catalysts, greener chemistry. We need to think about better, more energy efficient materials. This is something that is on everyone's mind, um, both in, in technology and also in policy. And this is uh, quantum computing would have a really big impact if we could say, find a better, more efficient way to do Haber-Bosch catalysis. So that's one concrete example. 
when do you expect that we'll start to see some of these applications become available? That's an uh, excellent question. So, you know, a lot of what quantum devices offer us today is um, a glimpse of what will be eventual big calculations we can run. So, you know, ultimately, some of these molecules and materials are very complex and require much larger, more complex quantum devices than we have today. So, you know, even a 53 qubit system is, is not going to be a good representation of some of these strongly correlated uh, molecular systems that we're interested in, the ones that I mentioned for, for catalysis. But there's a pathway. Uh, you know, there are various inflection points that people uh, refer to. So, you know, when we're at uh, a certain error corrected um, threshold, or maybe we get to a point with good enough gates but in the you know, few thousand qubit regime. And that's where we can start to see um, you know, something that really outperforms what you can do on the biggest, baddest classical computer. In fact, comparing classical computational power to these more um, you know, niche architectures, GPU-based, also uh, some of the, the, the recent AI chips that are coming online and comparing those with quantum devices, like those benchmarks, that, that's a field unto itself. Like how do you make this an apples to apples comparison? And when can you say one has outperformed a, a classical computation? Yeah. Um, when, when you decided to start Alira, what were some of the, your goals for the company? Oh gosh, um, so this was all well before the pandemic. And uh, there were students who uh, were working with me, a, a postdoctoral scholar who's working with me. Um, and, you know, we started to, we, we filed our first couple of patents in this space. Uh, they were handled by um, Harvard's uh, Office of uh, Technology Development. And the same person who was handling this, you know, set of, of uh, patents and, and advising us on it said, hey, um, there's this uh, physical sciences accelerator grant uh, you know, it's not much, it's, you know, a couple hundred K, but you guys should apply. I, I think your chances will be good. And, you know, it's a one pager with a short pitch. Um, and at the time I was a very junior faculty. I am uh, now on the brink of being uh, across that senior faculty threshold. And um, I thought to myself, well, yeah, this sounds like a great idea. Let's do it, you know, and, and we pulled that together. Um, gave a short presentation. And, and what I didn't realize in the, the presentation is that there were a few different VCs in the audience that were uh, actually part of the selection committee. And shortly after this pitch, I guess it wasn't the worst talk of my life. People, you know, said, hey, um, you know, uh, so-and-so was a, at your, your presentation and they wondered if you would be willing to come pitch to their partners. And I'd never done that before. Uh, the students and the postdoc who worked with me had certainly never done that before, um, but we showed up with, with five slides and said, here's our idea, here's what, what we want to do. Uh, and uh, some of the you know, folks there asked, well, do you want to start a company based on this? And I was like, well, we haven't really thought about it, but that doesn't sound so bad. I guess we'll do it. So uh, here we are, fast forward a few years, and uh, we're about 20 people and, and growing very rapidly. Well, that, that's very exciting. What, what technology is, is Alero sort of working on right now? Our focus has uh, very heavily been on clustered quantum devices. So um, if I have various types of quantum devices, can I pull them together to, to have uh, the opportunity to really do these big calculations, right? So there's one pathway that involves the hardware folks making a, a bigger more powerful quantum computer. There's another pathway that involves connecting these devices. Now, if I take two quantum devices and I connect them over a classical network, right? So device A and device B, I don't immediately end up with A plus B because ultimately if I'm going over a classical network, these are independent quantum devices. But if I go over a quantum network, now situation is quite different. And uh, that really got us to you know, where we are um, today, thinking about um, quantum networking, thinking about the applications of quantum networking, both in computing and also separately just in, in communication. Um, and our focus has been on, you know, abstracting just enough away from the hardware so that we can actually come up with um, a full stack here, including something that allows us to, you know, leverage hybrid 
uh, devices. So what I mean by that is if somebody puts a superconducting and a trapped ion system together, the trapped ion system might act essentially as a memory in, in such an architecture, uh, say in a, a fancy quantum data center somewhere, to make this whole thing go, to make the synchronization happen, uh, have a, a, a general control plane that sits on top. Those are all problems that you'd expect to solve in software. This is how they were solved in the classical networking space, and that's exactly what we're doing uh, at Lira. Well, as soon as you're talking about networking, there's lots of different components, both hardware and software. Is there a lot of collaboration between different companies on the different parts of uh, these networks that you're thinking about putting together? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, in fact, we have hardware collaboration, some that are really at the component level, uh, some that are at the system level, some that are at the quantum device level. And um, I think that's actually been very, very important. So we, I can't release the, the, the name publicly, but we're working with the utility company to actually um, show one of these networks combined, combining uh, pieces from, from a couple of different hardware uh, vendors. So it's, it's been very exciting to you know, see uh, a forward-looking utility company be so engaged in um, such a nascent technology. What, what are some of the uh, uh, sort of the key commercial benefits that will result from uh, these quantum networks once they're put together? You know, the biggest one is getting us to scale with quantum devices faster than uh, anticipated. So all of the promises in quantum computing that, uh, you know, we've been hearing about talking about in optimization problems and finance and materials, molecules, predictions, all of that relies on devices that are larger than what we have today. And clustering quantum devices via a, a small scale network is our uh, best and fastest and perhaps even most flexible path to get there. So that's a, a major important commercial application. Of course, there are other applications of um, secure quantum networks that um, have nothing to do with computing, but have more to do with applications in um, you know, secure transmission of, of information, national security implications, et cetera. Okay. And this is all like way more complicated than your basic like laptop computer. Uh, who do you think would be the major customers for these sorts of products, and at least at the start? You know, some of the folks we've uh, engaged with, there's a lot of interest from the, the enterprise standpoint. I think the, that's one of the um, first you know, adopters that, that we've seen for, for these technologies. People who want to use um, these quantum devices want access to the, the software that maximally leverages these devices without themselves having to um, you know, do, say, a synchronization problem themselves. Um, some of the other customers that we've engaged with quite extensively are in the, um, in, in the government, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, uh, especially, uh, you know, the, the Air Force has been very forward-looking in uh, embracing quantum technologies, and they've, you know, publicly announced a, a variety of programs. I mean, I know that this is, you're talking about how, how this is still developing industry. Where, where would, you know, just sort of looking through the looking glass, where, where do you think things will be in five to 10 years? Yeah, I think in five years, we will be talking about what have already been the first places of uh, uh, quantum computing uh, exceeding classical devices. I think we, you know, it'll go from which one do you think it'll be to this is the one it has been, which one do you think will be next um, type uh, of a, a discussion. I think also in five years, we will see the first few uh, entanglement generating and using networks uh, starting to, to come online. They won't be particularly impressive rates. They won't be particularly you know, long distances. Perhaps they might still be metropolitan area, depending on where the progress is with quantum repeater uh, commercialization. But I think we'll see that maybe in the next five to 10 years. Okay, we're, we're sort of increasingly being in like a, a global sort of situation, but what, what countries do you think are being the countries where uh, quantum computing is going to really take off first? There's been a lot of investment across the world, certainly in Europe and, um, you know, places like uh, Netherlands, it has a very strong quantum networking effort. Um, folks in, in Germany are, are investing a lot. Uh, there's also been a lot of investment in the UK. So I think I think folks there are doing pretty well here in the US. The National uh, Quantum Initiative 
um, signed into to law, uh, as well as uh, some of the other efforts now from the current administration have been really, really helpful in uh, pushing the technology forward. Uh, and of course, you know, every other day we hear uh, announcements in Asia. So I don't know uh, if there's a single country that would be, you know, uh, winning uh, the, the quantum race, as it were, but um, there's a lot of excitement across the board. In fact, in academia in particular, we have a lot of collaborations with folks in, um, you know, in, in Europe, we've uh, collaborated with test beds there. So I think uh, there's more opportunity for um, collaborative development of, of uh, some of these technologies rather than competitive development. Okay, and just sort of a wrap up kind of, kind of question. Uh, how would you personally see uh, success in this industry? I think the, you know, it's a important and, and philosophically <laughs> deep question, but I think the, the point where we can say, hey, here's an outcome from um, quantum information science, quantum technology is that I can explain in simple terms to, to my, my grandparents and they can tangibly say, oh, cool, I use something that benefits from that, right? So it could be uh, an awesome new um, material. Maybe I can tell them, hey, this went into the car you just got, or, you know, uh, hey, there's this catalysis thing. And, you know, they're maybe not directly interested in catalysis, but they're interested in um, breathing the, the cleanest air and, and drinking the, the cleanest water. I think if that level of impact can be directly attributed to something in um, a quantum technology, I think that would be a big success. Okay, well, Dr. Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, today to explain these exciting new developments in this in this field. And uh, um, thank you very much. Thank you.